God honors those who honor him. 1 Samuel 2.30 are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio. The following is entitled, Bad Girls of the Bible. Enjoy and have a glorious day. 6. Generous to a Fault that money talks, I'll not deny. I heard it once. It said, Goodbye, Richard Armour. Sophia opened the creamy white envelope with a single slice of her grandmother's heavy brass letter opener. A cherished and valuable item on a writing desk, it featured an intricately carved handle and sleek, polished blade. Quite the thing to use whenever she had an audience. At the moment, only her husband, Aidan, was nearby, absorbed in a book, giving little thought to the morning mail. No matter. That would change in ten seconds. Her hands trembled as she slid out the embossed card inside. The first few lines launched her heart on a merry dance. Finally! It was an invitation they'd waited years to receive. Sophia's lips pursed in a satisfied bow, as if she'd just tasted a bit of tangy lemon pie. Aiden, it's here. She waved the invitation at her husband of two dozen summers, pleased to see a smile crease his handsome face when the card came into focus. Aiden understood what this meant to her, what it would mean for both of them. Read it to me, darling. He tossed his book aside, offering her his undivided attention. She cleared her throat with a drama that suited the occasion, then began to read aloud. The Three Rivers Philanthropic Society requests your presence at their 100th annual awards dinner. Black tie only, please. Sophia practiced her most sophisticated laugh. Naturally! Who would dare appear in anything else? Noting the request for a response, she reached for the phone, then paused. Too eager, Sophia. After waiting this long to be included among the notable attendees, she'd hate to ruin her chances for future invitations with near-desperate enthusiasm. She would wait until tomorrow, at least. In the afternoon. Perfect. A dozen details flitted through her mind, demanding immediate consideration. Her dress would have to be elegant, conservative, Haute couture, of course, preferably European. If it complimented her emerald necklace and earrings, the ones that matched the deep green of her eyes, so much the better. Aidan's formal wear, freshly returned from the cleaners, would never do. Something updated and understated would be more apropos. Would diamonds in her hair be over the top? Should they rent a limo and drive her for the night? Oh, but that would be overdoing it. Aidan's deep voice penetrated her reverie. Don't spend all our money on appearances, beloved. His smile assured her he was only teasing, though he added, Your eyes are filled with shopping bags, expensive ones. We're supposed to be giving our money away, remember? Sophia pushed out her lower lip in an exaggerated pout, which never failed to amuse her husband and loosen his hold on her purse strings. I simply want us to present ourselves to this group in the most flattering light possible. He shook his head, clearly not convinced. It isn't fancy attire that will impress them, dear. It's an exceedingly generous check to the foundation that will win their approval. He tipped his silver-streaked head, assessing her. It is their approval you're after, isn't it, Sophia? No point arguing. Aiden had her there, and she knew it. Ever since they'd relocated to Pittsburgh twenty years earlier, struggling newlyweds on their way up financially and socially, Sophia had eyed the altruistic elite from a distance. Theirs was a quiet dignity that reeked of money, but even more of respectability. As Aiden's business acumen in the Golden Triangle grew, so did Sophia's desire to be part of the city's old money. Not for her, the circle of young movers and shakers, spending their hard-earned dollars on exorbitant trappings. It was the established families, living off wise investments, 
that appealed to some place deep inside her. Andrew Carnegie had set the pace in 1900 when the Three Rivers Philanthropic Society was established. Along with Carnegie, Andrew Mellon used his wealth and personal art collection to enrich the city, as did industrial magnates like Henry Phipps and Henry Clay Frick. In jest, Aidan whispered privately about keeping up with the Andrews. Or with the Henrys, Sophia reminded him with a wink, though she knew it was the Mellon family that garnered the most respect these days. Such names filled the Pittsburgh Phone Directory, the Carnegie Museum of Art, Carnegie Science Center, Carnegie Mellon University, Phipps Conservatory, the Frick Art Museum. Sophia and Aidan were prepared to wait their turn. It might be another decade before the two of them managed to donate the sort of funds that would put their name on a building. In the meantime, they had moved to an impressive home in Fox Chapel, made investments that involved both higher risk and higher profit, and finally had enough tucked away to offer a donation of some merit at the awards dinner. That was the point of the evening. Each couple or individual was expected to contribute at least one million dollars to the foundation. It was never stated as such, heavens no, but the two dozen players knew their appointed roles for the evening and came prepared to present a seven-figure check for a worthy cause. Aiden had earned his money by investing other people's resources, and now the couple was poised for their ascent into the rarefied air at the summit of the city's still-girded social strata. A million dollars, gone with a few strokes of the pen— the power and prestige of it left Sophia near to fainting. She responded affirmatively the following afternoon, secretly pleased at how easily she'd handled the phone call to one of the grand dams of Pittsburgh. They would fit in. They would. She was certain now. Sophia was scanning the New York Times later that evening, looking for some hint of an upcoming Manhattan runway show where she might find a suitable gown, when Aidan arrived home later than usual. She glanced up. Then the newspaper slid to her feet, forgotten. Aidan? He was hunched over the wing chair, his skin deathly pale, his breathing erratic. She shivered as if a breeze had skittered through the room. Aiden, what is it? It took a full minute before he could say the words. We're broke. We're what? It was inconceivable. Aiden, really? He yanked his tie off with a noisy sigh and tossed the length of silk in the direction of her oak secretary. Sorry to be so direct, darling. If you spend as much time reading the business section as you do the fashion pages, you'd understand. Understand what? She heard the terror in her voice, the discouragement in his. Start at the beginning, Aiden. What has happened to all our money? He quickly lost her in a barrage of stock market information that confused her further, but he clarified one thing beyond doubt. There would be no million-dollar contribution to the foundation, no dinner, and no new gown, not even from a dress rack at Kaufman's. What are we going to do? Sophia sank into the plump cushions of her pale striped love seat, her hands dropping next to her, limp. I can't bear to think of giving up our beautiful home. Now, now, my little Fia. He hadn't called her that since they moved to Pittsburgh, but she was too distraught to appreciate the endearment. He squeezed next to her, slipping a comforting arm around her sagging shoulders, a bit of color returning to his face. It's not as bad as all that— when I said we were broke, I meant our discretionary income has dried up. We won't lose our house or our cars. But mind me, wife, he shook his finger at her with mock severity. No more shopping. And no more philanthropic society? She knew she was whining, but couldn't seem to stop herself. Aidan slowly shook his head, his lips tightening in a frown. Not this year. But they won't ask us again, she wailed, smacking the love seat and his knee with equal fervor. It's our only chance. Sighing heavily, he stood and paced in front of her. Sophia, the only way we could manage such a donation would be to sell our property in West Palm Beach. Not our vacation house, she moaned. 
It's the only thing we own that's not mortgaged to the hilt. His confession pressed her back against the throw pillows. Are you serious? I'm always serious about money. You know that. He dropped to his haunches, the fabric of his fine suit stretched across his knees. Look, let me make a few calls, ask a few questions. They all have homes down there, she cautioned. Remember? That's why we bought a house in West Palm, to hobnob over the winter months with the old guard. If we put it on the market, they'll all know where we got our million. But wouldn't selling that property and willingly donating all the proceeds show them how serious we are about philanthropy? Sophia shrugged, seeing the wisdom of it even as she saw her precious second home on the nicest street in West Palm slipping through her hands. He patted her knee, then stood. I promise to be beyond discreet. Besides, when our bank account is bulging once more, we'll buy another one. A bigger one. He tugged at her ear with a playful pull. You fret too much, Fia. Let me worry about where the money comes from, all right? Your job is to find the most head-turning gown our limited resources can buy. Are we in agreement, then? The man was utterly charming. She couldn't possibly refuse him. I promise, husband of mine, I'll handle the cachet. You handle the cash. Three months later, she found herself slipping into a slim satin dress of deepest jade that matched the exquisite jewels dangling from her ears and draped around her neck. This dress does things for those bewitching green eyes of yours, Aiden murmured, fastening the necklace clasp, then nibbling briefly at the back of her bare neck. No time for that, she scolded, slipping her brand-new faux mink coat around her shoulders. She'd sighed over the real furs, but knew full well that in this social circle, animal fur was frowned upon. Her imitation was the best of its kind, more expensive than many of the genuine furs. It was full length and a perfect fit. With her hair swept up in a becoming French twist, Sophia almost didn't recognize herself in the mirror, so thorough was the transformation. She watched Aiden check his pocket for the fourth time, padding the envelope there for assurance. One million. No more, no less. They'd promised the society, in writing, that they'd donate all the proceeds, then place their Florida house on the market with a one million dollar price tag. Clever Aiden reminded her that if it sold for less than a million, they'd still be admitted to the society, having given more sacrificially than most. How could they have foreseen that a developer would come along and offer them more than their asking price just to close the deal in a hurry? When Aiden confessed to Sophia that they had a little more than expected, they agreed there was no need to add it to their contribution. Wasn't a million dollars enough? It was surely providential that they had pocketed a nice profit. Except it wasn't in their pockets. It was on Sophia's back and in their driveway. A faux mink and a Mercedes-Benz seemed quite the thing for their premiere in Pittsburgh society. They arrived at the dinner precisely at seven, noticing how shiny and showroom new their Mercedes looked next to the properly aged BMWs and Lincolns parked along the curb. Theirs would look used soon enough. Handing the keys to the valet, Aiden escorted Sophia up the steps to the club and steered her toward the first-floor salon, where the women gathered while the men convened in the second-floor smoking room. So it had been for a century, and so it would be tonight. For that, Sophia was elated. She wanted everything to be exactly the same as it had been in Carnegie's day, with one important addition. Her. And Aiden, of course. They wouldn't be there without his keen financial mind. He'd been especially free-spirited with their unexpected windfall the last few days, which had delighted her to no end. From the doorway of the salon, she admired his broad shoulders as he made his way up the carpeted staircase to the second floor. He turned to give her a confident wink, and she felt the heat rise to her cheeks. How handsome he looked this evening. His formal attire fit him like the proverbial glove, and his expensive haircut from Philip Paluzzi was clearly worth the investment. The man looked every inch a millionaire. For a brief moment, he would be one, before their check purchased their entree into a whole new world. 
feeling giddy, she pursed her lips in a swift, invisible kiss, which he returned before disappearing at the curve of the landing. Sophia spun around and floated into the salon, the corners of her mouth turned upward, not too much, and her hands empty, prepared to receive a glass, a handshake, or whatever might be offered. A matronly sort approached her, slipped her arm through the crook of Sophia's elbow, and guided her along a bank of seated women, as if they were flowers in a formal garden, being identified by genus and species. This is Mrs. Randolph McCormick. Her tone was starched lace. And Mrs. Daniel Stevenson. Pittsburgh steel. Sophia nodded politely. Pittsburgh plate glass. She smiled and bobbed her head past the dozen women with whom she would be sharing not only an evening, but, the fates willing, the rest of her life. She and Aiden had produced no children, just money. Their immortality, then, could come only from using those dollars to make a name for themselves. She couldn't help but notice how plainly the women were dressed. Their gowns were of a good cut, but simple in hardly the latest styles. Jewelry was limited to pearls or a tiny diamond necklace. Well, her striking green gown and glistening emeralds felt ever so slightly out of place. Though Sophia assured herself that she dressed properly, it was they who were out of step with fashion, not her. Grandmother had taught her to hold her tongue whenever she found herself in an unfamiliar setting, so she merely listened at the matron's elbow as the women discussed their various charity projects. How odd. No mention of trips abroad or shopping excursions. None of the usual subtle games of one-upmanship she'd seen in her own lesser circles of influence. These wives were genuine, nice even, and so generous with their time for community efforts, which could hardly have earned them much praise, let alone money. When a strange thump sounded above them, as if a heavy object had been dropped on the floor, the women jumped, then stared at the ceiling. After several seconds of awkward silence, the Stevenson woman quipped, Daniel must have dropped his wallet, which started a nervous titter of relief around the parlor. Moments later, a balding man in a bad toupee charged through the parlor doorway, his desperate gaze immediately landing on Sophia. Are you Aiden's wife? She nodded, her lips suddenly glued shut, and stepped toward him feeling slightly dizzy. Grabbing her elbow, he practically dragged her toward the staircase. If you would, please, join us upstairs. The gasps from the women behind her told her all she cared to know. This was not done, not ever. Something was very wrong. Before she could take one good breath, Sophia and her escort reached the second floor, where a pair of opulent mahogany doors hung open, and a circle of men stood waiting, ringed by cigar smoke and a shared expression of distress. Aiden was nowhere to be seen. Aiden? She started forward, but the balding man pulled her back with a gentle tug. What's happened? She snatched her elbow from his grasp. Where is my husband? The circle of men parted to reveal Aiden's inert body in a heap on the thick carpet. Aiden! Her hands turned to ice. There was no doubt. Aiden was dead. His color, the odd position of his limbs, the absolute stillness of his chest told her more than she could absorb. Had it been a heart attack? Some terrible accident? She had no answers, only questions spinning through her shattered mind like broken glass. Dead. Oh, Aiden. An ancient man stepped into her line of vision. He looked vaguely familiar, perhaps from decades of having his photo in the newspaper. We're truly sorry, my dear. It seems the shock of our confrontation was too much for your husband. Somewhere in the distance, an ambulance siren wailed. The octogenarian spoke again. Randolph here called 911. It was then she noticed the envelope in the man's hands, the same envelope Aiden had carried in his pocket. Is that... our money? His laugh was humorless. Ah, uh, well, it was your money. Your uh, late husband agreed, in writing, to contribute to the society the entire proceeds from the sale of your property in West Palm Beach. Is that correct? 
She tried to swallow, but her mouth was as dry as Florida sand. Uh, yes, that's right. He held out the envelope for her inspection. For a fleeting moment, she wished she had her priceless brass letter opener to use, if only to bolster her confidence. Instead, she accepted the envelope with a shaking hand, and realizing it was already open, slipped out the check. Forcing a smile to her face, she said brightly, One million dollars! That was the asking price for our property. His voice was low but firm. Yes, but not the selling price. Was it, Mrs.? She cut him off with a frustrated groan. It most certainly was. What does this have to do with my... my husband? Oh, Aiden! She stared at her beloved's body, shaking her head in denial. No, Aiden, not this. The ambulance was out front now. She heard doors slamming and muffled voices shouting, neither of which offered the slightest bit of comfort. Dazed, she murmured to no one in particular, What were you saying about the selling price? This is hardly the time, Mrs. Uh, well, if you must know, James here owns the Florida real estate agency involved. We knew the precise selling price and made our charitable commitments to various recipients based on that complete figure. But your husband's check was only... He cleared his throat with an awkward harumph. I see. She saw almost nothing, so hazy were the lights circling her head. They know. She was motionless, numb to her fingertips. It's over. All over. All she'd waited for, hoped for. Her life with Aiden, her future in society. Over, over, over. Her head fell back with a sickening snap. The medallions on the ceiling began to spin, followed by the corners of the room as she felt her legs give way. The plush carpet beside her husband's body rose to catch her in its velvet embrace. Greedy for a moment, dead forever, Sapphira. Sapphira was very generous with her monetary giving. Alas, she was also very generous with her momentary fibbing. Generosity was the hallmark of the first century church. New converts by the thousands pooled their resources and shared the whole shebang with one another, regardless of station. Mikasa Sukasa. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Acts 2, 44 and 45. The communes of the 1960s had their roots here. Imagine one big happy family of 5,000 or so. It was a unique experience in the history of the church, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a jumpstart, if you will, for the body of Christ. No one was more philanthropic than a certain fellow from Cyprus. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Acts 4, 36 and 37. Way to go, Joe, better known as Barney to his friends. Barnabas was magnanimous in his giving. Without being required to do so, he sold his field and donated his money, all of it we presume, so the apostles might divvy up the proceeds among the deserving. Other landowners in the brand-new congregation couldn't have missed the praise and respect showered on Barnabas for his selfless act. Barnabas was hailed as a hero and the epitome of encouragement, a trailblazer for others to follow. Even in the most egalitarian of economies, when someone is lauded above his brothers and sisters, the jade-eyed joker is bound to make an appearance. One couple in particular decided to play that ancient game of the Holy Land, Me Too. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. Acts 5.1 The also in this passage is a dead giveaway— pun intended. Ananias and Sapphira were clearly well-known among the believers. These two weren't no-names or low-profilers. My sense is they made sure of that. Perhaps they served in some leadership capacity for the young church, side by side as husband and wife, or had a thriving business that provided plenty of disposable income to support the cause. Whatever the scenario, two truths stand out. One, 
they were followers of Christ, and, two, they had the means to further his kingdom in a significant way. At first blush, Sapphira was a good girl, not a bad one. But while others were filled with the Holy Spirit, these two were drained of the Spirit's power, emptied by their own jealousy and need for prestige and recognition. By selling their land exactly as Barnabas had, they hoped to get the spotlight off him and on them. Two thousand years later, we foster such poorly motivated giving in the church when we offer brass plaques mounted on favorite pews or names leaded into stained glass windows or hymnals with the donor's name printed on the flyleaf. The sales pitch is obvious. Give in a big way so all will know how generous you are. It reminds me of a church I once visited that for years tolerated a sanctuary decorated with screaming green carpet. It was donated by one person under one condition. The donor got to pick the color. Why be cleansed by the Spirit when you can be awash in limeade? The carpet has since been replaced with a lovely shade more conducive to worship. And I imagine if such an offer is made in years to come, the building committee will wisely raise a red flag, not a green one. In the last verse and this one, it's clear that the twosome were working in tandem. With his wife's full knowledge, Acts 5.2. Other translations shed more light on the fullness of her knowledge. His wife had agreed to this deception, and they agreed to cheat. Unlike Adam and Eve, who took turns pinning the blame elsewhere for their deception, these two worked on a full disclosure basis, but only with each other. As one writer phrased it, they were agreed with each other, but not with God. The good news is, Sapphira wasn't painted as subservient in any way. The bad news is, she didn't prove to be very responsible either, as we'll see shortly. He kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Acts 5.2 Wait a minute. What's so bad about keeping some of the money? Wasn't it their money? If I sell a set of tires through Bargain Mart, am I supposed to put every dime in the offering plate? The issue was honesty, not money. If I sell my tires for $100, but say I got $80 for them and put that in the plate, as if it were the whole amount, quietly pocketing the $20 difference, and taking a bow for being completely altruistic, well, even with my limited math skills, I know that adds up to 100% deceit. The Apostle Peter knew it, too. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Acts 5.3 Wait another minute. How did Peter know Ananias had held some of the proceeds back? In today's real estate world, the selling price is a matter of public record, printed in the newspaper after closing. But in those days, unless the buyer bandied his purchase price about, how could Peter have found out? One commentator surmised, through the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, Peter received a prophetic insight, enabling him to read the thoughts and intents of Ananias and Sapphira. That's certainly within the realm of possibility. Maybe Ananias wore a guilty expression, had clammy hands, or couldn't look Peter in the eye when he handed over the money. Maybe the selling price did get around, such that Peter was expecting to receive a particular sum and was shocked when he didn't. In this story, it isn't the how, but the what that matters most, and it's not Peter's actions that are in question, but those of our ill-fated couple. What Ananias and Sapphira did was the first open venture of deliberate wickedness in the infant church. In that sense, they were very much like the first couple of the Old Testament— deceived, as Peter pointed out, by the wily serpent once again, and quick to lie to cover their sins. Greed was not their only sin, nor was it just the ugly fruit of that greed a false witness. They lacked sufficient faith that God would provide for their needs, and so hoarded some just in case. They lacked trust in their brothers and sisters to share fairly, and so kept a portion just in case. They lacked the willingness to live with less and place their hope in a spiritually rich future rather than a financially rich present. So they put some wealth aside, just in case. 
And just in case you haven't noticed, I'm stepping on toes here. They are attached to my own feet. Felt any pressure on yours yet? Peter made sure their claim to the land was free and clear, with no mortgage to swallow up the proceeds, and no moneylender waiting for his due. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? Acts 5.4 Ananias' response had to be, yes, and yes, how low his head must have drooped. What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. Acts 5.4 A thousand years earlier, David confessed before the Lord, Against you, you only have I sinned. If Ananias had made such an admission, even at this late hour, he might have been spared. We'll never know. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Acts 5.5 5. Splat! That was that. Notice that Peter didn't strike him dead. We're not even told that God smote him. Perhaps his own guilt took him out. Whatever the case, Ananias wasn't mostly dead. He was history. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Acts 5.5 5. The bad news got around fast, as it always does, followed closely by a wave of fear. One writer summed up the reaction of the witnesses to this tragedy perfectly. They knew God was not to be trifled with. Then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. Acts 5.6 I'm amazed they were willing to touch the body, so great was their apprehension surrounding the man's swift demise. It's certain they wasted no time in putting him in the ground, because the day was still young when the little woman showed up. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Acts 5-7 Where had she been, we wonder? Shopping? Getting her nails done? How had she missed the news? Wouldn't somebody, a friend, an enemy, have tracked her down to tell her what had happened? Perhaps Peter asked them not to, intending to give her a chance to clear her own name. Or perhaps their fear kept them from seeking her out. For God's purposes, it was important that she come alone and without forewarning. Just as these two were judged for their sins separately, so will we stand alone before God some day. No amount of my husband made me do this will cut the mustard, dear ones. When it comes to sin and judgment, God is exceedingly fair and frighteningly just, which Sapphira soon discovered. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Acts 5, 8 Peter offered her a chance to be saved from certain death. He was neither accusing nor judging her here. Her choice was clear. Tell the truth or tell a lie. He wasn't sealing her doom. He was giving her the freedom to come clean. In the words of one writer, Repentance was not yet too late. Return to reason was not even now impossible. As with Eve, all hinged on her answer to one question. Yes, she said, that is the price. Acts 5.8 Oh, we groan, knowing the inevitable outcome. Ananias held the money back as well, but we're not told he lied to Peter outright, as Sapphira did. Why did she sin even more grievously? Sapphira's lie began with fear, suggested one writer. Maybe it was the fear of not having enough, enough money, enough recognition, or enough of what she might have hoped those things would buy her. Love. We hoard when we fear loss. We can all live without stuff. None of us can live without love. When we see someone demanding attention as Sapphira did, it's a sure bet that what's needed isn't wealth, fame, or applause. It's love. But she knew what she was doing, that she was flirting with disaster, for the wages of sin is death was not a foreign concept to her. Sapphira chose to sin and flaunted her sin before Peter, before her fellow Christians, and before God. Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Acts 5 9. She and Ananias had not only agreed to keep some of the money, 
they must also have agreed that the Holy Spirit, newly abroad in the land, was not powerful enough to know of their deception. As such, they tested God's strength against their own and lost. If only they had written this truth on the tablet of their hearts. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Sapphira's name was as beautiful as a jewel, but her heart was as hard as a stone. Before long, the rest of her would follow suit. In that, she reminds us of Lot's wife, who also made one wrong move and paid for it with her life. Peter delivered her sentence like the bang of a gavel. Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. Acts 5.9 Even without an electric chair, her punishment was swift and terrible. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Acts 5.10 One might chalk up such a death as a heart attack if it happened once in a blue moon. This occurred twice in one spot in one day. Two such divine judgments tell the tale. When Peter said it would happen and at that moment it did, a promise from Proverbs must have run through the mind of the onlookers. The lamp of the wicked will be snuffed out. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Acts 5.10 were there any heirs? Did they use the balance of funds from the land sale to buy a dual grave marker? Did anyone mourn them? They certainly were remembered as partners in business, partners in crime, partners in death. Their sad story was recorded in Scripture as a lesson and as a warning. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Acts 5.11 this is the earliest use of the word church in the book of Acts. Note the other key word of the sentence, fear. How I wish that the whole church had been seized with great grace or love or joy. Those things come with the Spirit of the Lord, to be sure. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. During that season of signs and wonders and miracles, it was necessary for the Lord to strike fear in their hearts, the sort of fear that would ultimately keep them safely in the kingdom. Fear, when it is justified, is healthy. Fear keeps a toddler from running into the street the second time. The first time, it's a parent's wrath and promises of hasty punishment if the action is repeated that gets his or her attention. This toddler of a church in Jerusalem literally had the wrath of God presented to them through Ananias and Sapphira. We can sympathize with her naivete, identify with her unnecessary hoarding, and mourn her death. But let's not follow in her footsteps. Interesting how Sapphira's story still has the power to teach us. I was in the middle of working on this chapter when I stopped at an airport bookstore and spotted a lovely book of quotes. It was a small but splendidly illustrated hardcover gift book, which I snapped up with glee. I didn't even look at the price, expecting something in the range of $10. When the clerk rang it up as five ninety five, I silently marveled at the bargain and flipped open the cover to see if it was on sale. No. It was five ninety five in British pounds— but eight ninety five in American dollars. Since the British price was in larger type, it was obvious why the clerk had rung it up wrong. Since I'd already paid for it and put away my wallet, our transaction was complete as far as the busy employee was concerned. Okay, girls, what would you have done? I opened my mouth, then closed it. I checked my watch and reminded myself I had only twenty minutes until takeoff. I reached for my wallet and put it back, remembering I didn't have any more one-dollar bills. And besides, it would involve voiding the previous receipt and starting all over. It could take hours. Well, precious minutes at any rate. Was I within my rights as a consumer to smile and leave with my accidental bargain? Yep, which is exactly what I did, still ticking off perfectly valid reasons why my choice was fair and acceptable. An old memory verse ran through my head and stopped my heart cold. Anyone, then, who knows the good he ought to do 
and doesn't do it, sins. I was not struck dead at the airport, but to think that, knowing and loving Christ as I do, I'd still withhold money, acting as though it's mine to do with as I please, when everything I own belongs to Him, leaves me shaking my head in disgust. Instead of a simple bit of business at the register that would have left the clerk grateful for my honesty, and me three dollars poorer in cash but much richer in spirit, I carried my shame around with me all weekend. Even the joy of reading the pretty book was diminished every time I opened it and saw the correct price boldly printed inside the slipcover. Never fear, sisters, I asked God's forgiveness found the receipt, and sent off a check for the difference plus state tax. But how like Sapphira I was to sidestep the truth and pay for it later. I did not pay with my life, but to the extent that the spirit was quenched, an opportunity for demonstrating grace was lost, and the adversary claimed a small victory. To that degree, a tiny bit of my life in Christ was dealt a death blow. And for that, I mourn. What lessons can we learn from Sapphira? Pride and generosity don't mix. God delights in seeing us share our time, money, and resources for no reason other than the joy of giving. When our motives are pure, then giving is not only easy, it's downright fun. When we give with an expectation of receiving accolades or seeing our names carved in stone, though— the joy is gone, chased away by fear and a hunger for approval that can never be satisfied. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9.7 Learn to give when nobody's looking. I have a dear friend who loves to slip a hundred-dollar bill in an envelope and tuck it in someone's Bible when he or she isn't looking, someone for whom it means another week with a roof over the family's head or milk for the children. This is pure giving, without anyone knowing the source, not even the recipient. My friend simply writes, A gift for you from Jesus on the envelope. I would never have known if I hadn't caught her in the act and been sworn to silence. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Matthew 6, 3 and 4 Honesty isn't the best policy, it's the only policy. Sapphira could have saved her life and learned her lesson if she'd only reconsidered and told the truth. There might have been a penalty to pay and she'd still have been a widow, but a living, breathing one. When we have a choice, and we always do, let's tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. In the long run, it's easier. Nothing ugly to cover up or worry about. In the short run, it's the right thing to do. Always. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Psalm thirty-four, thirteen. You pays your money, you makes your choice. Sapphira made the wrong choice because she was pursuing temporal riches instead of eternal ones. Before we donate our resources, let's figure out what's in it for us. If the answer is nothing, then we can proceed with joy. The wise woman makes giving a priority, knowing that when she goes to glory, it's all left behind anyway. Let's choose carefully those recipients for whom our gifts could mean the difference between a meaningless death versus a meaningful life in Christ. The truly righteous man attains life, but he who pursues evil goes to his death. Proverbs eleven nineteen. You are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio.